Hi. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the invite here, and what a wonderful uh, start. Uh, Dhruv, Prashant, Pankaj, Arvind, and the full 256 team. Um, very proud of being associated with 256 Network, uh, one of the unique, the only kind in the world, I presume, at this moment. Uh, I'm here to talk about India as an investment opportunity, but also about the India-UAE corridor. Uh, I'm sure many of you know some of it or all of it, but do bear with me for the next 20 minutes. You know, I think this is known, but let me just, uh, I'm going to quote uh, a Morgan Stanley report many times here, uh, uh, this most recent, but fundamentally, even the government and uh, statistics are talking about, by 2030, an eight trillion economy uh, overall. Incidentally, that means about 10% annual GDP growth. Now, that doesn't seem possible right now, but I just want to mention that uh, history is no longer going to be what's going to come in the future. And the reason is very simple, that there is a new economy parallel to the infrastructure economy or the brick and mortar economy, which was always there. And to that extent, the new economy is driving a lot of it, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, per capita income, 5,200 in the next few years. That's en enormous. Very, very large sums of money by Indian standards coming to consumers. That's going to drive consumption in the country. Incidentally, IT services business is targeting 500 billion by 2030. And it's above 200 billion software services. That's cash coming into the country. So India will have the power, again, as we move forward, to buy things uh, at a national level. Um, exports, as you see, for the last six year, or five years before last year, exports were stagnant. And today, exports are growing at about 30% or 20%, 25% per annum. We expect India to be at 4.5% of global exports from 2.2% at this moment. Um, but last but not the least is renewables, and we talked about climate uh, as such. I think climate is going to be very large. Um, renewables are 22% of India's total consumption of energy right now. It's expected to grow to 41%. However, there is a startup ecosystem which is emerging. It's very small right now, and I'm going to talk about that as to how that is going to be effective in investment opportunities as far as the country is concerned. If you look at India, I believe there are three very strong elements which are driving the new economy as far as India is concerned. One is digital, the other is electronics, and the fourth is, uh, third is climate. We did some research, in fact, we're going to release it in January, and the elements of that are the following. The tech startup ecosystem today, very few people know, about 15,000 companies have been funded. I'll speak a little bit more about it. There are 75,000 startups in India. The tech startup ecosystem funded by angels and VCs in the country is about 15,000. And the revenue of those is $35 billion today. Right? There's no rocket science here. You can find out from the registrar of companies what these companies are. There are 25 companies expected to cross in the next five years a billion revenue each. In my own portfolio, I have five of them. I never expected that a startup where we funded them and they were a few lakh rupees or a few hundred thousand rupees a month, they would be in 12 to 13 years building revenue propos propositions of a billion revenue each, and that only on the Indian market space and a little bit outside the country. So a 200 tech startup, 200 billion in five years, a tech startup economy. Electronics, predominantly smartphones, cell phones, and now other hardware coming in, this was never the case. Uh, through PLIs, through other incentives which the government is giving, manufacturing is something which is very, very uh, uh, important and crucial to the Indian economy, which is uh, dependent on hardware quite a lot. I was talking to Satish, and a lot is happening in terms of building hardware uh, as such. The software uh, services in five years is expected to 350 billion, and this is uh, based on a, a report by NASCOM. India's stack, I think uh, uh, Prashant spoke about the India stack. UPI is planning to go to 34 countries across the world. And we made a rough estimate that if only a few percentage points of the top 10 economies where UPI and elements of UPI are adopted, that's a 200 billion revenue 
potential in the market space. Last but not the least is climate. Now, climate, you've seen a small number here. And the reason is because it's unknown. I'm not talking about investments in solar, investments in big wind power mills. Those are infrastructure investments. I'm talking about digital data. I'm talking about agri-tech. I'm talking about some of the elements which are there, which are emerging right now. So digital electronics and the whole space of climate, we are looking at a one trillion revenue. Uh, VCs normally don't talk about revenues, but I'm talking about revenue as such in a 2027 time frame, which is humongous. This is the investment opportunity which we have never seen before. I want to quote Lenin, perhaps a wrong gentleman to quote at this moment, that after the war he said there are decades when days go by, and he also said there are days when decades go by. India today is at a stage, in my 20 years of investing in India, there are days when decades are moving. It's really moving fast right now. Now, I spoke about the revenue, 35 billion today, in the startup ecosystem, but I want to go to a little bit of elements. Today, we see about 10% of those startups having international revenue. We expect this to grow to 25%. This is humongous. Now, this does not mean that it will only be manufactured in India. It also means that if you look at international consumer company, I have a very simple example. Um, in our consumer companies, we have seven manufacturing units in India. Now, when they want to export to India, from India, that's one way of doing it. But if you want international revenue to come in, we are looking at manufacturing outputs from other countries. And that is the holy grail for us. Because if you do this, pricing, product uh, innovation, R&D, becomes very varied and very, becomes region to region. So international revenue of Indian startups expecting to be around 25% is absolutely something which will happen. Um, overall. Yes, of course, additional unicorns, but I want to make it clear that we're expecting billion dollar revenues. Already in my portfolio, I have 750 million revenue companies. That means the whole industry are at the verge of generating billion dollar revenue companies in the country. That has never happened before. Tech companies are a massive supply chain to IPO. Now, a few have happened. Yes, I understand that many of them are below the IPO price. But, you know, that's transactional in nature. There is a supply chain of companies which is now emerging, and these are going to be every year, plus or minus a few. But that's something which is a holy grail for us. People ask me, what are the sectors which are going to be emerging as investment opportunities? I've named a few, but my answer to that question is every tech. Every single sector in the country has to become efficient. Every single company has to become efficient in the old world. And new companies in technology are going to make that happen. So every tech is the investment opportunity as far as India is concerned. I also want to mention one thing, that the rise of the Indian investor. The rise of the Indian investor is Indian rupee capital, and government is also making some changes to regulation where Indian capital can now invest more outside the country. I think some happened recently, more is likely to happen. So we are talking about cross-border investments happening more and more, less right now, but more. 10% of Indian cap of total capital in India is rupee capital. We expect this to rise to about 25% in the next five years overall. These, if Indian capital is investing in the risk asset class in India, this hopefully gives confidence to international investors to come to India in a much bigger way. Now, Nandan spoke about a population scale economy. And I think people like me have taken that to heart. And here is what we believe is in the process of happening right now. UPI is being used by approximately 260 million Indians, which means if you take a product in the country, potentially 260 million people can buy it because they know how to transact through UPI. This 260 million is my population scale economy at this moment. UPI is going to be covering at least 75% of the Indian economy in the next 10 years, which means we are talking about 750 million people who can buy and transact on the, on the internet. That is your population scale. There are a billion people who need 
uh, insurance. There are a billion people who need consumer lending. There are a billion people who are looking for very, very good consumer products in the market space. And that is your holy grail for population scale economies. And other numbers follow. I want to mention that to go to a, a population scale economy, it is not just the marketing side. It's not just the consumer side. It is not just 150 million farmers. There is a change required to product. There is R&D required. There is uh, design required. And all this within the sustainability issue. Many of us wear specs here. Lenskart is one of our companies. And they have now set up manufacturing plants where they're manufacturing 100,000 units a day, the largest in the world. But they address maybe 50 million people selling a glass at 500 rupees. For them to go to another 50 million people, a 500 rupee glasses has to be at 400 rupees. That means to sustain margins, how do you bring pricing down? How do you design a new set of eyewear? And how do you take India, which is 80% myopia, like all of the other countries, and coverage is 20%, how do you fill the gap? That is the holy grail, because that's not covered right now. So product design, manufacturing, and the whole area of marketing is going to be very, very crucial. A lot of money is going into manufacturing and design and R&D. If you look at trends which are there, deep tech, We've seen one of our companies' vision being to replace chemical colors in the world and plant-based colors. That's climate. Small company based in Pune, and they've extracted color out of bacteria during COVID times. It was very scary. And they've extracted five colors, and during those times, these are now being looked after as proof of concepts by global companies for replacing chemical colors. It's a huge market but it requires small pools of capital to come in. And we are seeing that deep tech companies are emerging more and more as far as the country is concerned. If you look at the domestic market share, the share of one billion revenue companies is going to increase, as I mentioned earlier. If I look at many of the companies, and I'm taking our own companies as anecdotal evidence because I know them very well, the top layer of companies are raising capital because of two reasons, or three reasons. Not to burn, not to fund burn. They're raising capital organically to grow international, inorganically to grow international, and domestic. Some of the larger companies are starting to buy companies outside the country. The quantum of pool of capital required is going to be huge there. In our own portfolio, this year, total capital absorption for inorganic growth for international has been $400 million. That is humongous. And we believe for all portfolio of all VCs in the country, that's going to rise every year. I must say that if a product is designed for the Indian consumer and the product is high quality, Indian consumers demand lower price. If a product can be meeting a price and a quality feature of Indian consumers that can go anywhere in the world. And there, it needs high tech, it needs high tech manufacturing, and a lot of money in design. If that is the case, and a few companies meet that, we are finding that those companies can go even in Western markets and in other markets like Africa, I think you mentioned Africa earlier, because the price points there are lower, but the margins can be maintained because the design has been done in India. I do also want to mention that there is a paradigm shift, and this is my belief, you won't find it in reports, there's a paradigm shift happening in the next 10 years. The paradigm shift is Western technology for emerging markets will be replaced by Indian technologies because Western products are not made for emerging markets. If somebody has to sell eyewear in India for 500 rupees, they'll make a loss. That's the only way Indian companies are going to grow, and they are doing that right now. Deep R&D, deep product design. Global uh, domestic play is going to be combined, is already happening, and manufacturing operations. We found this only in the last four years. During COVID times, we had to reduce cost. Burn had to go down. Entrepreneurs were absolutely brilliant in reducing burn. And the only way they do, do that is not in the front end by reducing cost of consumer acquisition, by marketing spends being low, but they could have to go into the back end. 
So again, manufacturing design is going to be very crucial. It's already happening in a small way. I want to mention how these companies later will come to the international markets and the corridor between UAE and India. So what's the investment opportunity? Last six years, India has absorbed $150 billion worth of capital. We believe in the next five years, it's something close to $350 billion. This is absorbed, not, rate, not raised a capital. That's the multiple which we are looking at in terms of capital coming into the country. Technology, venture and private equity, both co-investments. Why is this happening? Because there's a stable policy regime, taxation regime. It's not perfect, but my belief is if it remains the worst case, the same as it is today, we have a perfectly very innovative venture and private equity market in the country. So that's the big opportunity in the country. Most important, exits. India has returned in the last five years about $80 billion worth of exits, and we believe funds are returning them, companies are returning them every year, year after year, and at top 10 to top 25 percentile in terms of returns. This, especially with the institutionalization of venture firms, because many, many venture firms are now more than 10 years old. That means they have three funds under their belt, they have expertise and institutionalization and process, which is very, very important for global LPs to come into the country. Incidentally, we believe that 50 to 60% of uh, exits have taken place through secondaries, and the balance is through M&A and IPOs. IPOs will increase. M&A a little bit patchy because we need more companies from outside and more companies from inside to buy venture companies. But secondaries is remaining the holy grail, and we are finding large number of secondary funds coming and large number of private funds coming to buy secondaries for companies which are growing just before IPO. One factor I want to mention, a lot of numbers here, but if you look at 2021, India's PVC investment ratio to GDP was 2.58%. And if you look at the US, it was approximately 4%. If India has to grow to an 8 trillion economy, what that means is that the ratio has to increase. I believe that this will increase. I do not know the numbers. But it certainly has to go to an upper limit of double the investments in the country which India can absorb, and the big reason is the supply chain of entrepreneurs is there to stay. We are seeing around 4,000 entrepreneurs every year. I'm sure Axel sees much more, and that number is growing, especially in deep technology. So, if I look at performance, we are looking at seasoned funds who have been around for 10, 15 years, delivering in dollar terms net 15 to 25%. And that, again, on exits year after year after year. You'll find many firms having returned exits every year for the last 10 years. Yes, there are risks. There's no question about it. I won't go through the risks in detail, but fundamentally, especially funds, there are new Indian VC funds emerging every year because Indian capital is playing and growing into large funds. I want to mention something about the UAE and India corridor. The UAE-India corridor, and I can only mention from what we see in our own portfolio, UAE is being used as a jumping board for UAE markets, as well as for Africa and Saudi Arabia. If I just look at our own companies, about five companies are operating here. For the market, their revenue right now is $50 million. In two years' time, the revenue is expected to be about $150 million. And if I look at all my nine companies which are operating potentially and now in the, in the UAE, Africa, and uh, the region in uh, Saudi, we are looking at a $750 million to $1 billion revenue in the 2030 time frame. And if I look at the whole industry, that's a humongous number. The reason is because there are markets here, and markets lead. What that also means is operations people on the ground. At a 50 million revenue, our companies have about 100 people on the ground in UAE right now. Now to service Africa and Saudi, we can't be shipping products from India all the time. That means manufacturing units have to be set up. If manufacturing units have to be set up, Indian companies have a choice to set them up in this part of the world 
or Saudi, which is a large market, or Africa, which is also a large market. They will evaluate this. They will evaluate this. And that's where the partnership between UAE and India can go enormously. And Pankaj, to your point, it is not just companies coming here and taking care of the market. It is also investments here overall. First Cry is a company which is, very, is a UAE market leader in baby care products. 70% of their sourcing now happens from UAE, 70%. But we went deeper and we said, hey, what, where does the 70% come through? 70% comes through traded products, which means they can be replaced. So the, the, the paradigm of investments from Indian companies into UAE for these markets, only on technology, only on software, only on AI, will be crossed immediately because brick and mortar will take over. Manufacturing is a very big opportunity. Trading, warehousing is a very big opportunity. And that, to my mind, is the holy grail for these two countries to work together. Thank you very much.